Uh, the person who's associated with the acronym BRICS, uh, Lord Jim O'Neill, former Common Secretary, UK Government, joins us from London to talk about what he makes of the Rise with India theme and how strongly he believes in India's future. Jim, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks very much for taking out the time to speak with us. Now, you know, habit requires me to ask you broadly first about uh, uh, world markets. There are a lot of uh, uh, market speakers, legendary investors who are calling the end of the bull market that we're seeing across asset classes. Do you share that view? You know, I think there are sort of three conflicting issues going on. First of all, by definition, uh, markets have had a very strong run with very low volatility. Uh, and uh, at some point, that will come to an end. Uh, and the more it goes on, the more value-driven investors and commentators think, well, we must be closer to the end than the start. Uh, and that makes sense. Secondly, of course, with the uh, signs of improving economic recovery in, in uh, much of the developed world, uh, even notice Japan publishing remarkably strong figures earlier this week, uh, we have the, the threat of QE, uh, which has helped uh, the world economy and markets in, in some cases, Japan, for over a decade, but in others, certainly a few years, possibly starting to come to an end in more and more places. And of course, it's already ended in the US. So both of those things are, are, are I guess, why some people feel uh, the markets uh, may be coming to the end of the rally. Uh, the third thing, which is contradictory, is that we are seeing in most parts of the world uh, more and more signs of improving economic momentum. And typically, uh, during that phase, equity markets do pretty well. So, uh, and I think it's particularly true for many so-called emerging markets, which don't look that expensive relative to the developed world. Jim, hi, morning. So can emerging markets chart their own course? And how do you see the emerging market versus developed market trade? I, I don't like uh, the idea that all emerging markets should be regarded as one and the same. But uh, nonetheless, uh, people still do. Uh, but it's very difficult to generalize. Uh, that said, secondly, I think most so-called emerging markets... Uh, are relatively cheap uh, compared to uh, particularly the United States. So from a value perspective, uh, in a rising uh, overall global market, I, I would expect uh, many uh, so-called emerging markets to continue to outperform the developed markets. Thirdly, uh, however, uh, as and when the Federal Reserve Board, if it does, uh, start sending signs of accelerating, tightening more than markets currently think, I would imagine that will be a period where a number of so-called emerging markets, possibly including India, uh, might go through a, a more volatile phase. Uh, I quickly add, it's not clear to me that we are there now. The Fed still seems to be sending a very strong message that they're going to be very uh, cautious in raising interest rates. So what about uh, you know, emerging markets uh, and within India, where do you see things moving? Um, so it seems to me, uh, in many ways, India uh, and its markets continue to be in uh, almost a perfect storm that we have uh, reasonably benign commodity markets, uh, oil prices, not really doing a great deal and certainly not rising much. Uh, often because India is uh, such an oil importer, as you know, when we go through periods of very rapidly rising oil prices, it causes problems with imported inflation, etc., etc. And we're not seeing that. And of course, we have such a benign uh, environment uh, in, in global interest rate markets. So these two big external factors are being very supportive of India. Uh, and of course, uh, even though there are plenty of structural challenges in India, uh, there has been some progress on reforms, uh, goods and services tax, for example. 
And so uh, all of that on top of the fact that India grows uh, these days by probably more than China uh, is a pretty favorable general background for India. Right. Jim, you know, we at ED Now are uh, running with our special Rise with India campaign. It's our new manifesto. Uh, we've redesigned our logo, you know, to you know, make the theme uh, more complete. Uh, what's your own perspective on India's core strength, uh, which lies in, in its demographics and domestic consumption pattern? Uh, do you believe that India, India's current economic model can make it far more resilient versus other emerging markets, especially at a time uh, when a crisis hits markets across? Um, you know, it's always the, the, the truth. Is, uh, the truth of the, the matter is answering that question is we will only find out afterwards. <laughs> uh, but my, my suspicion is that India uh, is in a slightly better uh, position to withstand uh, an adverse move uh, in global markets. Uh, but we should never. Uh, underestimate the connectivity of markets around the world. Uh, a very, very tangential point. Uh, I still remember uh, the 1994 bond market route as though it was yesterday. And I happened to be in Australia, uh, and there was nothing going on in Australia, but, but that week Australian bond yields rose by 100 basis points purely because of things that were going on in the US. So. I would be very hesitant in saying that markets can ignore things going on elsewhere in the world just because their own fundamentals are good. But that said, I think the Indian market is in a better position than it's been uh, to withstand external shocks, yes. Right. So what is your outlook for India's economy? Can we grow between the 6 to 7% or even beyond perhaps in the future? You know, in the past 20 years, uh, India has shifted its growth performance from what used to be affectionately or, or quite rudely often called the Hindi rate of growth, which was about 3.5%. You know, India has been growing now on average the past 20 years by probably around 6.5%. Uh, and Modi deserves quite a bit of credit for the past uh, couple of years of that, of course, but some of it has gone on. Uh, before, uh, reflective of better policy from a number of governments uh, and the, the good job that the uh, central bank has done, particularly under its uh, previous governor, I would say. But what I think Modi uh, has started to do uh, is, uh, partly because of his political uh, popularity, is to, is, is to begin to uh, deal with some of the even bigger challenges such as trying to make, uh, from an economic perspective, India more of a genuine uh, economic one nation. Uh, and that's, of course, why the goods and services tax is so important to make it essentially a, a unified economic market around the whole wonderful country. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, because of the demographics being so favorable, if India could uh, uh, unleash more private sector investment uh, and, and improve the rate of public sector investment as opposed to wasted public sector spending, uh, it is quite uh, feasible that India could grow by 9 or even 10% uh, for the next 10 to 15 years because it has such favorable demographics. Uh, and I think Modi is taking India in the right direction. So, Jim, do you think valuations are slightly stretched? Uh, and uh, given the current backdrop, uh, do you think uh, India is, uh, you know, insulated to the world crisis ever than before? Uh, and one of the reasons why I'm a bit more relaxed than many other commentators is that we we, do, we don't have the mood around the world, from what I can see, of rampant optimism about equity markets. We're we're not at that phase yet. And so I, I think global markets, notwithstanding a bit more volatility, uh, probably got quite a bit more upside uh, in them despite some valuations. But to come to your specific question, it's a very tough one, but a good one. Uh, 
And I think the thing is that the, the Indian market has primarily re received a lot of support uh, in the past three years from remarkably benign global circumstances of, of essentially uh, repeatedly surprisingly low inflation which has allowed for US and other monetary policies to be so benign. Uh, and it's made it easy for markets with uh, good local returns um, to, uh, to and, and, and potential higher future returns to do so well. India epitomizes that. And, and what I would say uh, to sustain that into a whole new territory uh, links to what I said uh, uh, a few minutes ago, I think, particularly now that Modi has embarked on the reform with like the things like GST and to some extent also the demonet so-called demonetization last year, it's now opened the, the, the idea to investors that, that Modi is prepared to deal with big structural challenges uh, for India's future. Oh, yes, indeed. Finally, Jim, as we let you go, um what gets you thinking about the big risk uh, faced by world markets today? So, of course, I have to answer as, a, as somebody, notwithstanding what I said right at the start, you know, I have been uh, looking at markets for over 35 years. Uh, I mean, usually, usually something that none of us can identify. Uh, and I say that, of course, with all this uh, noise about uh, North Korea taking place. So, who knows? But, but that said, if, if it were something that we can identify, I think, I think because of the enormous rise of China uh, and the role that China's played in the world economy, if something went really, really badly wrong with China, uh, I would imagine that would be quite a problem for many, many uh, markets around the world because of China's economic importance. But uh, let, let me just add quickly, I do not see any signs of that in the foreseeable future. Jim, such a pleasure speaking with you and thanks much for sharing your view on India, where you feel the developed markets are going to head and where does India lie really in that emerging market pack.